Welcome to the E Show, presented by the Hockey Podcast Network. Founded in 2013, the EHL is your next step on the path to college. Over the past decade, the EHL has established itself as the college placement leader on the East Coast. And now, here's your host, the commissioner of the Eastern Hockey League, Neil Ravin. Thanks, Jim. With that, let's bring in Jeff Mills. Jeff, we're going to be joined later on this episode by Jake and Anthony. But right now, yes. we're joined by a very special guest. For the first time, we've had a, a graduated, graduated player on the podcast. Please welcome on Wiggle Kerbrat. Welcome to the podcast, Wiggle. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. Wiggle just said to us that it makes him feel old, but Wiggle, don't worry. We're still, uh, I'm 34. Neil's about to be 33, so we're yeah. still much older. No, it's but. crazy to have like players on the podcast that have graduated from college, Jeff. Like that's, yeah. he feels old, we feel older. So team, team old guys, buddy, team old guys. <laughs> <laughs> and you teased this during the week. Uh, and for those that don't know, yeah. Wiggle played for the Avalanche back in the 17, 18, and 18, 19 seasons. And I think undoubtedly had, Probably the best name ever in the history of our league. <laughs> Easily. But Wiggle is not really your first name, correct? No, it's Michael. Yeah. So how did but, Wiggle become the nickname, I guess you could say? Um, I just stopped moving when I was little. And so my parents called me Wiggle and it just stuck. And then it kind of crept into the classrooms and friend groups and rosters. So um, I've kind of been going by Wiggle for the last, I don't know, 15 years, something wow. like that. Love it. And you're actually working uh, in New York City now, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I work in finance uh, since I graduated from Wesleyan. Okay, so that's a big boy job. Um, do you yeah. go by Michael or Wiggle in that job? Uh, it depends on who's in the office. The, young, okay. the younger people call me Wiggle. Um, <laughs> the more like older senior people call me Michael. So um, <laughs> kind of got two names around the office. Okay, that's okay. cool. That's fair yeah. enough. That's fair enough. Two different personalities, two different lives, basically. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I I, right. I live a double life now. On the weekends, I go by Wiggle, and on uh, Monday through Friday, I go by Michael. That's too funny. That's too funny. <laughs> I love, um, it. I love it. But let's uh, let's start to go back to those those junior years because following uh, his two years at with the Avalanche, went on to play at Wesleyan. But with those two years with the Avalanche, it always kind of uh, gets to me a little bit when I pull up your elite prospects profile. You're one of only a handful of players that can say you won two EHL titles. Um, do yeah. You, do you pound your chest over that? Yeah. I, I, I pounded my chest probably more so in college um, <laughs> because of like the guys on my team. And, and there's a lot of EHL guys on the team. And so um, a couple of Rangers guys, especially. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> And that relationship that, uh, you know, yeah, that rivalry is still heated, Wiggle, just so you know, yeah. just Good. just in case if you haven't turned in. Uh, and actually, Wiggle, I was going to ask you, too, as far as your first championship you had uh, with uh, CC Mario, and the boys, you actually jumped in late. You only played nine regular season games. What made you make the transition over to uh, the Avalanche back in 2017-18? Uh, yeah, I was in uh, Rochester, and team wasn't doing very well, and kind of hit like a point where, I wanted to go to school the next year. Um, I needed to get closer to, to the colleges that I was talking to. And uh, the abs kind of became an option the last day of January or something like that. And um, I had a couple hours to decide because it was right before the deadline, I think, at that point. And so yeah. decided to pack up the car and, and move to New Hampshire. Um, and then I obviously had great experience and, and loved my, I guess, year and a quarter there um it was a lot of fun and being a california boy how did you hear about the new hampshire yeah. avalanche um i had a relationship or i have a relationship with uh a guy based in connecticut who's from california and he's friends with sorella uh, named steve Nodor. and um Novi kind of called me and i told him i was like i want to leave um and so he said like let me see what i can do made, made a few phone calls and um, earlier in the year, Connor Kucharski uh, oh, yeah. had left my team and went to the Avs. And so um, it was kind of a familiar, you know, a little bit more familiar place, I guess. Uh, talked to Kuch and, and then, you know, next thing I knew I was, I was playing for the Avs. Did it meet your expectations? Did it exceed your expectations, your experience with the Avalanche? I mean, 
I, I, I like look back and say it exceeded expectations. Um, I was able to go on and like have, have a great experience, meet a lot of great guys. Uh, and, and I wasn't like, I could never thought I was going to go. I never thought it was going to go the way it did. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would say very much like exceed my expectations. Yeah. And Jeff mentioned earlier, uh, you come in, you put up points right away. Eight games in those nine, or eight points in those nine regular season games, three more in the postseason. But then obviously you come back for the full year uh, in 18, 19, at 73 points in the regular season, four more in the postseason. Um, I want to test your memory for a second because I actually called the Avalanche games that year. And one of your That's linemates right. was, was Jake Atkins. There was a play yeah. when you flipped the puck from, I think you were in your own zone, and Atkins was on the far wall on the other side of the ice. And he catches it like on his hip and then roofs it top shelf. It was one of the craziest goals I thought I had ever seen. Do you remember that play? Um, to be honest, I don't. Okay. Um, <laughs> but like, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't seem far fetched in the sense that uh, like we would try and like throw the alley oop play to each other a lot. Yeah. Um, probably more than we should have. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah. And so, um yeah i mean i guess that's a cool story i just i i, I can't remember that that goal particular. i just remember like that was you know because what, what coach sorrell likes to talk about a lot with his teams is he's more about depth than than ever having you know the number one guy but when you got the chance to play with a jake atkins you were two of the arguably top five forwards in the league that year did it feel like that for you guys when you were on the ice yeah i mean i think one thing that was special with playing with Jake was um, like, we kind of found each other in training camp, um, which like, it doesn't always happen. Sometimes you got to like the coach juggles lines and bouncing around and you kind of find your niche like halfway through the year or through, you know, throughout the year, but we kind of found each other in training camp. And so because it was so early, we like were essentially a pair. Um, and, and, and when it came to making the lines and, I could probably count the number of games we've played on different lines, you know, on, on a few fingers. And so um, like when I got to play with Jake, it was a lot of fun because it was, there's consistency there. You knew how he was thinking the game, where he wanted to be um, like what his preferences were. Um, and then you can kind of play off that. And I thought it played into our creativity. Um, I think really where it showed a lot was like on the power play uh we like Sorello would drop this like one three one or all these plays and we'd be like okay and kind of like throw it out the window and then just be like I think this works better and not that we're trying to like big dog Sorello but like we just <laughs> we thought we we thought like we could make little tiny plays like we had a we had a play between the two of us where like we would like skate behind the net and then just throw it out the backside and that probably had like eight or nine goals that year. Um, and so like, it was just little things like that where we could be creative within the system we were given. Yeah, for sure. But with me and Neil, the way we know Chris Sorrell, I can see, I can see him go. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You couldn't see my face. I can see him in the, yeah, yeah. I guess that works. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. The thing was, was it, 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 about half the time it worked. So like half, like half right. the time pass rate, I think was good for him. So for sure. For yeah. sure. Uh, you kind of teased this earlier. Um, obviously, you've had so many players advance on to to Wesleyan throughout the years, um, especially from the Avalanche and from the Rangers, right? So let's put you on the spot again then. Uh, why would you say the 18-19 championship Avalanche team was better than the 2020-21 championship Rangers teams? Because arguably, you could say Ooh. those are probably the two best championship teams of all times. I mean, you look at the forwards, the D the runs the goaltenders went on. I mean, look at your goaltender uh, and Nathan Pickett that year. He was basically unbeatable uh, in the month yeah. of March. If, if 18, 19 abs faced off against 20, 21 Rangers, how good would that matchup be? Is is that the Rangers team with LaChance? Uh, yes, it was. When he yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. LaChance, yeah. Right, so, yeah. Go, baby, I mean, uh, those guys. Uh, I, I'm very lucky I got to play with Jake um in college you know he's an he's a player um i mean obviously i think the yeah, as would win 
um <laughs> that's just like my unbiased opinion yes uh <laughs> and if i remember didn't they of course i gotta bring it up but didn't they didn't they score the goal off sides oh that there we go. <laughs> <laughs> you do still talk to coach Sorrell, like coach mark Bielo. uh had to bring it up yes no but the still photos the still photos yeah, yeah. Are, are pretty close yeah no pretty but damning. I, I, I say that because my college roommates uh were was andrew pratt so yeah. um who was on yeah, that yeah. on the rangers team and so and my roommate now played on the rangers 18 19 so um it it's more of a jab at them but uh yeah i mean i think it would be a great game both teams were, were really deep um i think our team that year was really deep I, yeah atkins and i like happened to be towards the towards i guess the top in in terms of like sheer numbers yeah. um but I think like what goes unnoticed with that 1819 team was like truly how deep we were. Yeah. Um, I mean, like you had Nick's on it, Nick Scrawless, you had Kyler Harding. Yeah. Um, you know, Devin. We're just Pepe. talking about AJ Prostowski the other night. <laughs> yeah, AJ Prostowski. Of- yeah, like <laughs> we were a deep team. Tough kid, so huh? yeah, um, AJ's awesome. You just kind of said something a second ago. You have a Rangers uh roommate right now. Is that what you just said? Yeah, I live with Go Yumera, who was on the Rangers. Uh, oh yeah, 19. So go that's Yumera. crazy. Yeah, we you that. got you got guys who have graduated from college are now living together in New York City, Jeff. That's gonna make you shed a tear a little bit, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know um, what tissues do here, but, but no, but it's a great transition to your to your time with Wesley. And can you talk about now for the you know players that are you know coming into the EHL and the ones that are actually in the EHL? what it's like to go through the process of being recruited to a NESCAC school, because it's different from a lot of other D3 schools. Yeah. Um, well, my experience with other schools is like, it, it's a lot of rolling admissions. And so mm-hmm. like they can more freely present offers um, from like what I remember. Uh, obviously it's been a few years, so I don't know if it's like still the same process. Uh, but with regards to like NESCACs in particular, like, there's more defined recruiting periods essentially. Um, and it's like centered around the admissions uh, cycle. So you have ED1, you have ED2, and then you have regular decision. Um, and the coaches kind of have to play a little bit of juggling from my experience in terms of like who goes in what cycle, um, because like they have to essentially spread it out across the, the cycles. And, um, and then academically, like for NESCAC, you're pulled pretty aggressively uh, in terms of like your GPA and your test scores. Um, and so really like if you're kind of like smart kid, but you might not have like the best test score ever. Um, for me, it felt like it was a lot of like numbers juggling um, that they were trying to like fit into the class. Um, and so it's just kind of uh, part of it. I, that was my experience. I, I don't know how, like much that's relevant now um but you know i i i loved my experience at wesleyan and i was like super fortunate that it, it worked out the way it did for sure and Wiggle, what would you uh what kind of advice you know neil just asking about wesley what kind of advice would you give to any young guys out there that are looking to play junior hockey about the ehl what would you you know tell them about your time there and why they should come join uh, a junior hockey league like the EHL if they did have uh, interest in wanting to go play college hockey like you. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing like first generally about the EHL or sorry, generally about junior hockey is like you, you come in um, and there's guys that have already played and it's like really the first time, maybe if you play high school hockey, it's a little different, but like I played club hockey. So it was really the first time that there was like, got like you're walking into a new room like someone else's room essentially what it feels like um and so there's that kind of like period where uh you kind of got to keep your head down work hard you know earn your stripes a little bit um and then you know really the best way to do that is just you know showing up early leaving late working hard um and competing as much as you can as hard as you can uh and in terms of the ehl i think one thing that like really stuck out about it for me was like the proximity to all the schools um, that I was interested in, right? And so like, I wanted to be in New England, I wanted to play in the NESCAC. And so um, I wanted to be like right in the middle of it. And so that to me was like the best part was, um, you know, I could have a 
all my games within a two hour radius or, you know, with maybe a two and a half hour radius. Um, and every game there could be a school there uh, that I was interested in. Um, it was manageable for them to come. And to me, I think that like really helped because, you know, like I think P Potter at Wesley and the head coach there was like able to see me more often than mm -hmm. um, if I would have been in the Midwest or, or in Canada. Um, when you look at those Wesleyan years, obviously you mentioned this earlier, Jake LaChance got to come back and, and, and play in the EHL in a season where you didn't get to play at all because of, of COVID. D did it ever cross your mind staying at Wesleyan for one more year because you, you could have, or were you ready to be done after four years academically there? Yeah. My, my, my class. And I joke about this all the time, like, because we all had the one extra year. Mm -hmm. um I think for me I, I think I think for me given that I had aged out and I had gone in as a 21 year old um it was it, like it, I knew this was my four years like and that's kind of how I looked at it um I think for other guys like it's a different question because they did have you know guys went back and played juniors like Jake LaChance or not um but at the same time like we all like kind of just moved on. No one really went back. Um, but it is something we joke about because like it, like it does feel like a tease having the year that we did our senior year, knowing we all could come back. Um, but it is what it is, right? We all made, we all made our, the decisions we made. And um, obviously I wouldn't change the experience or, or those decisions. Um, you know, I'm really enjoying what my life looks like now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously it was, it, the questions did come. Yeah, Cause you did win a NASDAQ title while you were there. I don't believe it was, it wasn't your senior year though, correct? No, I was a freshman. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. so it did, you had to be a captain though, but did you feel like at least having that NASDAQ title, whether it, it, it didn't come in your senior year, but it, it did, it provide you at least that closure that maybe you said, like you said before, you could turn the page after four years. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the, 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 that winning that nest hack was like really cool because it's like the, the, the naiveness you come in and you're like, like for me personally, like I, I was too, I was at the ass for two years. We won both years. Yeah. I come into Wesleyan, we win at Wesleyan. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm, I like, I was like three in a row, like, and we're going <laughs> to the NCAA tournament. Like, yeah. this is like, this is a blast. And hockey's like been so fun the last three years. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it does help a little bit kind of turn the page. Yeah. Um, the one thing I do wish is like that year that we did win, we never got the tournament because yeah. it can't, it was canceled the night before our Babson game or a That's night, right. two days yeah. before our Babson yeah. game, uh, which is our first round game. Yeah. And so, um, that part, like, I always like have, like, have a what if. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I had a great career in college, you know, we won the NESCAC my last year as senior, we were the number one seed. So like, I, I, I don't hang my hat on or hold my head. I don't drop my head on anything. Um, yeah. I had a great, great experience and a great career. We still do the what if on that year too, Wiggles. <laughs> and there's still plenty yeah. of coaches that do too, right? Yeah. Jim yeah. Boston and the Lumberjacks think they would have won it all. For sure. Capri, but he, but he gets to still say that he won three championships in a row, right? That's so. pretty good. <laughs> and I'm a one twelfth national and I'm a one twelfth national champion. So <laughs> I like that. Ooh. I like that because we never know what would have happened that year. <laughs> um I guess we'll wrap it up with this though, because you've looked at this in that in this last part of the interview um uh, in, in a very mature way that you just knew eventually hockey was gonna end. And my mom always joked when I was growing up that you know all roads meet lead to Ben's League, right? So um are yeah. you still are you still skating? <laughs> Yeah, I skate. Um, I don't not as frequently as I'd like. Okay. Um, but yeah, I I play on on the weekends. Um, one of my coworkers played at Tufts, so he helped me, you know, skate with the guys here in New York City. Um, and then last weekend, a bunch of my Wesleyan teammates and the guys I went to college with all uh all went and skated together. So um, we do get out there, uh, but obviously not as much as you know we'd like or or hope to but it's a great perspective for for those players to know that you can get in the four 
years of college hockey that you want, and then eventually uh, the book will end, right? You, you yeah. eventually have to get a job. Uh, I, I guess what I ended with this, actually, um, you, you mentioned how you always wanted to go to a NESCAC school, and now you're working uh, in New York City. Is this, had, did, did this all play out the way that you hoped and envisioned, I guess you could say? Um, yeah, pretty close, pretty close to it. Uh, yeah, I'm very goal oriented. And so a lot of, you know, everything that I've done was a goal. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's cool about or different that uh, about NESCAC schools is like, I think largely across the board, you kind of go in knowing you got four years and yeah. you're going on to work. And so, um, the guys, not only prepare you to play, be the best hockey player you can be, but they also prepare you to be um, the best candidate and ready for the professional world that you can be. So it's yeah. been fun. And um, yeah, I enjoy it. I'm happy. And, and uh, I think really the last, you know, I call it six years were, were awesome and um, I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. Well, it's awesome for us, for Jeff and I, you feel old, we feel older, um, but we also feel <laughs> proud to, to, to know you know, what our league can help a player like yourself accomplish to go on to Wesleyan and now be working uh, in New York City. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time out of your work day, not not class day, Jeff, <laughs> to get on this podcast yeah, right. with us. Um, and uh, we hope to have you back on again soon for sure. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Wiggle. Good to see you, buddy. All right. See you, guys. Thanks again to Wiggle Kerbrath for coming on the podcast this week. A Wesleyan graduate that makes Jeff and I feel extra old. Um, but with that, let's bring Jake and Anthony on, guys. Um, for the four of us now, this is crazy to think about, but we're recording and dropping this podcast on Friday, February 23rd. Does it feel like the regular season is just over, you know, only has like all 10 days left or so? Does it feel like that for you guys? No, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah it's, yeah, it's creepy. It's creepy. When I was just doing games all week, it was like, when I was like, all right, and after today, uh, such and such is going to have four games left. Such and such is going to have five games left. That's mm -hmm. when are we getting uh, that uh, 82 game season, Neil? I heard that was coming. <laughs> <by -by>. Oh, <Wow. laughs> oh man. That would be, Neil just yeah. got exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a, that would be a junior hockey first, though. That's for sure. Uh, to, to play the, e, the EHL would have the most conditioned players going into college hockey. Oh God, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'd have a lot of thirty goal scorers too, Anthony. But um, but to, but to answer your question, Neil, I mean the eighty sevens were already. Chris and I are both done with our home broadcast for the regular season. Like that's, that's insane. it. That's insane. The showcase play left for you, baby. Yes, R and the eighty sevens do play today. Um, a very big game in the South Division. So let's start talking about where all these divisions stand uh, and around the East Show. Let's take a look at what's going on around the E Show. Around the E Show is presented by BioSteel, the sports drink of the EHL. Use the promo code EHLB1. That's EHLB1 for 25% off when you check out at BioSteel.com. So we'll actually start though up north where we just finished off a regional showcase and uh, I, I refer to it as an appetizer um, because there were 16 games uh, at that showcase. Uh, we, I mean, there's days where we have more than 16 games in one day. Like, do we yep. have 21 games in a day? Twice. We yep. had just had 16. Like, that's why it felt like so, like, just like loose. Um, yeah. But it was just kind of like, huh. Relaxing. Uh, let's just play yeah, a few more games. Even though we, we fell behind a couple times. So I had a couple of log games, Avs Chiefs, a couple of ice issues. Hey, yeah. no major penalties. Good job yesterday, boys. Look yes. at you. You're all very awesome. clean day. Our league disciplinary department really appreciated that. We need one of those. Yep. Yep. But we'll start in the North Division. I got to start with actually my anxiety. Um, when we're going through Drink the standings seven. every year at this time of year, oh. I always get like anxious that like someone's not going to finish at 46 games. So oh, like when you look at all the game, like the game play column, right? <laughs> Like I like the math is easy, right? The Wolves and Lumberjacks each have three games left next weekend. That gets them to the to their forty six. But like the Avalanche, I have to remind myself they play one more time Saturday, then they have their three, right? So I'm constantly mm -hmm. like counting to make sure everyone actually gets oh to forty six <laughs> because like I just feel anxious that like someone's gonna miss one year 
and it's just gonna be like my fault for it. Oh but, god. Yes. Neil and numbers. Neil uh, and numbers. Numbers baby. numbers are just uh, you know a, a moral en enemy, right? But starting with that North Division, I find it interesting what each team has left and where each team is kind of at right now, right? So the Avalanche have a game left against the Express tomorrow at home. And then, of course, they have That's their three schedule. showcase games. But they're already locked in as the number one seed in their division. How do you approach these four games if you're if you're the Avalanche? Well, that's the interesting part about it, right? Is I had the pleasure of calling their two one OT win. Uh, I, I call it my pleasure. Chris and I think Jeff Perot both agreed that wasn't either their pleasure. Both teams were kind of just you know going through the motions because uh, Providence, of course, has clinched, and we'll get to the Central a little bit. But uh, both teams had clinched a playoff spot and kind of were playing like it the other day. Um, so yeah, I mean, that is a little worrisome, Neil, uh, Jake and Anthony, when it comes down to getting ready for the playoffs, cause then you gotta do the old flip the switch, but yeah, you gotta wonder if these few games too, uh, with Chris, he's playing against all playoff teams. Will yeah. those teams decide to rest some guys too? So you might get kind of more of the, you know, maybe call a couple guys up. You just called Grant Curtis up the other day and got him his rookie lap and got him some minutes and stuff. So Anthony, over to you. Excuse well, for me. well for, for the Avalanche, the fact that they clinched the number one seed, that's the most important thing, right? Because you're going to go up against other teams where, yes, they clinched the playoffs, but they still want home ice advantage for the first round of the postseason. So I think for a lot of the other teams, it'll be important for them to win. For the Avalanche, not so much because, again, you know they, they have that number one seed. So I, I think for you know Chris Torella, maybe you do want to bring in some more guys from the EHLP, let's say, and get them some EHL reps. Because at that point, you just want them to get some experience and maybe start looking you know, in the long term. So I think for the Avalanche, you can afford to start some rookies and maybe not put out your – or maybe not uh, try to win out all your six games and just kind of rest up for the postseason. Yeah, they. Uh, I think it was it was Tyler that was telling me yesterday that they went five and five in their last ten of the regular season last year going into playoffs, and obviously they ended much earlier, and they still made their way to championship Sunday last year. Yeah. So like, I trust that Avalanche team to to turn it off and turn it on when they need to, and do and maybe go out the motions a little bit more than they ordinarily would. But I mean, the number one seed in the league is still up for contention, and that obviously yeah. matters if you're a team like the New Hampshire Avalanche, whose division it really is to lose at this point. So that does matter in itself, but um, I think it's going to be one step at a time for those guys. And, uh, you know, like I said, they made their way to Providence last year without the strongest finish. And yeah. they pro if, they, if that happens the same way, I wouldn't be shocked if they do the same. For sure. For sure. I did remind all those coaches that no regular season champion has ever won the EHL Frozen Finals. <laughs> Maybe it's Cup just the strategy like... to, to finish not right there. Just, <laughs> just put the um, They all kind of gave the same reaction, though, Neil. They were like, yeah, yeah, we don't that. <laughs> Eh, we don't want, eh, I'm like, mm, okay. You're the yep. first yep. team to win, but win both. That's what I say. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Exactly. Right, um, right below broken. the Avalanche, Seacoast is locked in as the two seed, too. Um, as Jake reps his. Jake's repping them hard. Spartans. <laughs> <corners>. <laughs> um, we'll get to what's the, what undershirts under that in a second. Um, but anyways, uh, Seacoast <laughs> locked in as two. It's funny. They played Valley twice, and then they're the only EHL team that only plays two games uh, in Philly, because of the odd number of teams, there was one team per league-wide showcase that played two games at each event. So if you look back in Worcester, Maryland only played two games. Look back in Newington, the Terriers only played two games. So Seacoast is the one that only plays two games in Philly. So they have two Valley games left, two games in Philly. And, and Coach Trotter himself said, we're going to play this thing out as hard as we can the rest of the way. So... That's something to to take note of, right? Especially because you look at now Valley. Um, yesterday was the first time we've had two coaches who were uh, discreetly trying to keep eyes on each other while they were playing at the same time, right? So 11 a.m. was Vermont versus HC Rhode Island, and 11.30 was Valley versus the Apple Corps. Mm -hmm. um, both teams lost in regulation and – I think it's safe to say, Jake, right? Both coaches were kicking themselves afterwards. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, especially with the way Vermont, I, I mean, they uh, they had all the momentum in the world after Trent King had scored that goal, and it just fizzled out. And, I mean, credit to HCRI. Like, they're, they have, they've had some moments this year where they haven't been able to keep the puck out of the net as effectively as they wanted to. 
But I mean, Neil, you and I watched the last 10, 15 minutes of that game. Vermont didn't get anything going. And obviously that's a pretty tough forward core to slow down. So credit to that HCRI defense. And I mean, Valley hung around too. I mean, five on five, that game was really close. The Apple core is a team that's going to make you pay on the power play one out of every three times, pretty much. And and they do that more effective than any team in the league. So, yeah, I mean, Valley's a team that is going to stick around until the very end, like they always do. I mean, they're a pesky group and uh, you know, that's part of their identity this year and I, uh, I, my money's on Valley going into the final stretch. <laughs> they play Seacoast today and Seacoast Thursday leading up to that showcase, right? So uh, Vermont has become very big Seacoast fans all of a sudden. Maybe they're all wearing their own quarters uh, right now. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, but right above them, too, the Wolves are at 42 points. They probably feel pretty good after that shootout win over HCRI. Obviously, it would take them most likely losing out. Vermont would have to win out to to surpass them um, to to get the forty three points. So Wolves really probably need one, if not two, points just to make it official, uh, or get some help with one of those teams losing as well. But um, it yeah. looks like it'll be Avalanche as the one seed, Seacoast as the two, Wolves as the three. So that would mean Seacoast and the Wolves would face off in the first round for the third straight season. Uh, and then pick pick one <laughs> symmetry. Val- yeah, pick one Valley or Vermont uh, for that final spot. So um, we will have one more podcast though to to set things up for where everyone's at heading into that final showcase, especially Valley and Vermont uh, to the yeah. East Division. Uh, and I want to start off. And I know Anthony has mentioned this in some of his short shifts posts down the stretch here. What Bridgewater has done in the second half, I know it's not like you know an immaculate record. But they've turned things around, you know, pretty damn well. And that win over the Express yesterday, it, it has to put some fear in the Seahawks locker room, right? They're competitive now. Like they're even even if they're not winning a lot of games, they're competitive. And I think at that point, especially in the final stretch, that's all you could ask for. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, and- that was great seeing uh that was a great interview, Jake, with uh with Cohen and Flanagan yesterday. And those two <laughs> giving a little insight. Those two have been great, right? Flanagan's been the backbone of that team. He wears the yeah. A for a reason. He truly is a leader. And yeah, good to see those guys. Anthony said it best. Like there have been so many times where like I've been like inches away from interviewing Flanagan and like they just lose in the most heartbreaking way. And it's <laughs> like they're just in the and they're in a lot of games and it just hasn't the cards haven't gone in, in their way. And that's like another team in the East, uh, uh, the Terriers. I mean, how many one goal games have they been on the wrong side of yeah. just another one yesterday? I mean, yep. their team that if they just you know, figure out how to eke out those games. Like they're, they're a team that could make their way uh, a little bit deeper than anybody's expecting a four seed to make it. Can, yep. can I just go? Can I just go back to that Bandits game? Flanagan with that great poke check on the breakaway, oh, only for uh, Cohen to go the other yeah. way. Also, shout out to Tyler Arago. I know that call must have been a little hard for him with his express, but that was a really good <laughs> call for that Cohen goal. Yeah, good job, Ty. I think what we'll have to do also, Jake, when when things are all said and done this year, is do like a top ten of what players are wearing when you interview them because just like the range of just outfits that they come out in like Cohen had taken off the shin pad. So his socks were still on um, and and the whole top was off. Right. Uh, But then Flanagan had put the Jersey back on and the pads were off. So it's just, uh, he looked interesting. I was like, what the hell is he? I'm like, well, and oh, he just and it's a goalie jersey, 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 Jeff. So it's right. like it's like Huge. it's a tarp on him, basically. I, I never had met Flanagan before, so when he walked out, I wasn't even sure it was Flanagan. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, "I'm Brendan." Oh, there. Like, Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, that's cool. You wear Flanagan's jersey? Did you get an autograph or something? Like, no, I am. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, uh, but just to recap, where guys are at, I mentioned Bridgewater. So they have five games left, and they're at 23 yeah, points right now. So obviously. Behind. What? What you? Oh, five, five points, points behind. behind yeah, five and, games it, left, yeah, and they have ten possible points, right? That's the big yeah. thing that we're going to keep harping down the stretch here is the possible yeah, points it's... that everybody has left. Uh, the Seahawks have four games left with that five point lead. Uh, the Terriers, because of some of those one goal losses, Jake are locked in at four. Um, they have mm-hmm. already given me the date and time for their play-in game that they'll be hosting. Um, they have not given it to an opponent because they don't know who the opponent will be yet, right? So um, well, we know we have at least one play-in game on the calendar. I find it interesting that the Rangers still have six games left. Um, that's a lot to play yeah. down the stretch here. But they can, you know, with some help, they could pass 
uh, the Wizards and the Express. And I'm sure uh, Coach Cota was a little frustrated only getting one point yesterday with the battle that they have going on with East Coast for that first, you know, first place spot, but they still got the point, right? So again, back to that same conversation we have with the Avalanche, it, it, it's different for this division, right? Because the Avalanche know they're number one in their division, right? These guys, these three teams at the top, they may have to play it out uh, throughout the end of the regular season because we don't know, we won't know who one, two, and three are in the East. Anthony? Wait, uh, oh, yeah. did, did also just... Just a scorekeep here. Did did we talk about the biggest story in the East Division with the East Coast Wizards ending the winning streak? Oh, we hadn't got to that for, yet. for New York uh, Apple Corps. The yeah. second longest streak in EHL history has come to an end, and it was the East Coast Wizards who did the deed. Yeah, yeah, it was a it was a great win for them. I thought it was an excellent hockey game, very fast paced. Um, I don't know if this is going to come off as a chirp to Gus Ackerman, but when he wins the game, I'm sure you were wa- watching Anthony. Where was he going? Like uh, he skated to the red line. Uh, goalies, I mean, goalies, 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 goalies do different things. Yeah, goalies do different things, right? I mean, I whenever a goalie wins a shootout, I always know something's coming, right? Um, yeah. But oh, this yeah. wasn't a shootout. This was just the final horde sounding, and then he skated to the center ice dot. But hey, Jake's favorite goalie did that once a few years ago in Exeter, also Tristan Fata did. Um, he did like a. I don't even know. I oh, forget the right. cel- you, you, I can picture it now. He like yeah, did this like I remember that. celebration I remember in the, the middle of the gesture. ice. Gesture. Yeah, it was yeah. almost like Terrell Owens type thing. But anyways, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Anthony, they, they that is a the- disgusting act. <laughs> <laughs> they did snap the twenty game winning streak though, um, and it's just gonna be interesting to watch that East Division and see uh, who does finish one, two, and three uh, to the Central um, Railers. Have won six straight. Apple Corps, you mentioned, uh, saw their 20-game winning streak uh, come to an end, but then got back on track with a win against Valley. Uh, they only have three games left to the Railers four, and the Railers have the one-point lead. So, uh, Jake, I guess this question is for you. Do the Railers feel like they're in the driver's seat right now uh, for that one seat? They obviously control their own destiny down the stretch. Is that the message that you're hearing? Yeah, I would I would say so. I, I mean – they're not the type of team to go softly into the end of the season. They're going to try to do everything they can to be in playoff form. I mean, this is a deeper roster than they had last year, just in terms of the number of bodies, right? So there's still a lot of competition for lineup spots out there. Not everything is is set in stone. I'm sure it's that way for a lot of teams right now. I mean, we still have the, the P to E roster freeze not even here yet. So like yep. there's – all kinds of um I was gonna say I saw to you do, I saw you do an interview with three EHL P players who all lit the lamp for the oh, yeah, EHL yeah. team the other day. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was pretty cool. They had combined for like nine or ten points that game, if memory serves me right. So that was uh exactly so nothing set in stone right now uh, in, in that lineup for Worcester. So yeah, they're not gonna go out quietly, they're gonna try to win and, and guys are gonna be competing. For sure. For sure. Do they want the regular season championship, Jakey? Do they? Does Coach, I don't think I asked Coach Bertoni about that. I would bet on it. I think yeah, they I do. Would bet on yeah. it. I think they. Yeah, do. I think they do too. From knowing them, <laughs> uh, it's but it's going to come down to those two teams for that for the one and two spots in that division. And Jeff, you mentioned this earlier. Providence obviously has clinched the playoff spot, but they can't yep. get complacent down the stretch here because they haven't clinched the three seed yet. Uh, no, but they were dealing with a ton of injuries and. For sure, no, for sure, for sure. I'm just pointing yeah. out that HCRI, uh, you know, picked up three or four points in in Exeter. They they're on a four game point streak. Uh, they are always yeah. a good showcase team. I feel like yeah, they they they're definitely always are. Yeah. a good showcase team. They're always getting like four out of f- or three out of four, five out of six. They're always doing that. I feel like yeah, they're five yeah, points the behind. Brothers had a winner to right? What was that? Jake interview. I remember one of the Spec twin brothers had a game winner against the Wizards. Mm-hmm. And Jake yep, and back in New England. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yep. So they're they're five points behind the uh th- Providence for that third spot. Um, which of course that's big because three gets at least guaranteed two games and four post the play-in game, right? Yeah. And and that's we touched difference. on this yesterday uh in, in person, Jeff and Anthony, you guys weren't there, but uh the Rough Riders aren't out of it yet, technically. Hmm. Now, oh. it, there's only what there's only one scenario that they get in, right? And, and it's as simple as this: out. the Chiefs have to lose out with every game in regulation, and the Rough Riders have to win out. 
that it does hmm. include each team has five games left. Does include one game against each other, but the Rough wow. Riders hold the tiebreaker over the Chiefs, so it, it's still possible. This that we're just stating are, facts. Are, in this all, podcast, are right? all those games against each other because they play like thirty games against each other each season? <laughs> no, there's a there's a Rough Riders eighty <laughs> sevens game in there, Anthony. Anthony, <laughs> Anthony Sorella tuning in from New Jersey. <laughs> so it uh, it looks like. The way the standings look right now, you can take a screenshot, and in a week, they'll be the same, and in one more week, they'll be the same, entering the postseason. But in, in the central, things can juggle here down the stretch. Yeah, That's where we have be to interesting. point out. Chiefs um, have not been able to find the back of the net recently, too. It's been a tough go over it for them since losing uh, Jake's old boy, Zach Rillo. So, yeah. Oof. Look uh, out. Watch out. <laughs> we'll see. To, to the south we go, and the Bears are almost back. The number Back one seed. Town? They're almost the number one seed. Um, they need to get to sixty points, I believe, or at well, least a, right a, now. A combination maybe? of that, or or if the eighty sevens were to drop a game, the Little Flyers and Maryland can't catch the Bears. They each only have four games left, right? Um, but the eighty sevens can with like the Rangers, six games left, but they have a game today against Maryland, and right now those three teams, eighty sevens, forty seven points. Little Flyers, 47 points. Maryland, 46 points. Who finishes two? Who finishes three? Who finishes four, Anthony? Yeah, I mean... Assuming the Bears are one. Right, yeah. And I think for the 87s, even though it's still possible, I I don't think they can realistically take the number one seed. So I think right now their top priority is just securing that number two seed. And right now, if you can see in the standings, coming into Friday... They have two games in hand over the Little Flyers and Team Maryland. Yep. So they have this matchup at Piney Orchard Arena against Team Maryland. And that's one where they hope to not only win, but try to win in regulation, right? Try to get some more separation while still having two games in hand and try to get some more separation from the Philadelphia Little Flyers. Because I don't think the Flyers play again until Wednesday. So I think the 87s are going to catch up in terms of games played. For, yep, 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 for sure. Um. And 87s, we mentioned, play Maryland today, and then they get the Huntsman tomorrow, and that's going to be... Well, both t- both t- uh, EHLP and EHL, 87s yep. Huntsman. It's going to be a big day at power play rinks. It's just, and what I was going to say, Anthony, is you're going to see the most desperate Huntsman team of the season tomorrow yep. because they're three points back uh, of PHC uh, with the equal game count. Right, EHC um, had a big win against them, if memory serves right. Cross Sherman made like 25 saves on 26 shots. Yeah. You know what I should do while we're on the podcast, Anthony? We don't like doing math on the podcast, but we should know yeah. right now uh, who holds the tiebreaker if those two teams were to tie. Because uh, the key thing to note for the South is obviously no one's going to play each other uh, in the showcase. So uh, the tiebreaker, the first tiebreaker, head-to-head head points. points is already going to be yeah. done. Right. So uh it's it's for, for, for the huntsman though, how do you control your emotions knowing it's a must win hockey game tomorrow night? Oof. <laughs> That's a really dark question <laughs> that probably none of us have the answer to. I don't know. Call Sub- 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 substitute Sub- nerves with focus. That's what Seth Gustin told me about the lumberjacks oh. approach. So Ooh. there you go. That's 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 what I got. <laughs> I'm not in their shoes, but that's what uh that's what the goose told me. Okay. Um, and, and just so we're all on the same page now, the Huntsman do own the tiebreaker over PHC, okay. right? Just to that math out. So that's key to note. Huntsman, um, or sorry, PHC, I should say, plays the Bears this Saturday, who could be playing things out to try and officially stamp that number one seed. Um, and then PHC gets the Wizards, the Bandits, and the Express. Uh, at the showcase, and I think we can make this accurate statement. They're all playing for something. Uh, the Huntsmen, yep. as we mentioned, are playing the 87s tomorrow night, and then the Wolves, Rangers, Applecore at the showcase, and where each matchup falls in that order, they could all be playing for something too. So uh, it could be. Just want to say everyone voted this showcase in, so we want any complaints <laughs> that there's a showcase to end the season. This I, has been talked about for years. You wanted it, you got it. Now Jeff, swim in your own pool. Jeff, honestly, while same, it's sixty-four games and it's gonna be exhausting, it actually 
here's why it's actually easier. You like me. it? Okay. Here's why yeah, it's actually easier it. for me. When the two teams are, are close to tied or whatever are going to be asking me questions and they'd be calling me in a normal year, I'm going to say, come into my yeah. office. Walk There's, in my office. So in between ranks three and four, in the back of the building, this is for coaches, not not parents. Oh, don't <laughs> I, give your, I will don't be give hiding out. Away, bud. There, there's oh, a there's okay. a back room there, and there's actually a TV that I can connect to, and I can pull up the schedule, and I could count out with everyone where the tiebreakers are. Right. So I actually did this yesterday with with the uh, lumberjacks and warriors. This is crazy. The lumberjacks win the tiebreaker over the warriors by one point. Ooh. Lumberjacks collected seven points in matchups against the Warriors. Warriors collected six. Wow. Ooh. So like so this overtime loss in there. They, 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 they were, I think there were two or three overtime games in there between the Lumberjacks Ooh. and the Warriors, right? So this final stretch here is going to be very interesting and compelling to see, you know, how everyone plays these games out. Um, and, and just a reminder, when you win your division, you get seated based off where the four division champions finished. Uh one plays four, two plays three in Providence. So just another little element to factor in uh, as we go down the stretch here uh, and into the postseason. But we'll go to the EHLP next, now that we've set the table for the EHL. Um, and I guess we have to start with history because we mentioned the Apple Core history there, Anthony. Uh, with every win the Railers collect, I mean, this is getting closer and closer to setting the record, guys. I mean... They're 36 and three. Oh, wow. Like this that, is, that's insane. This is a special, special season. Um, and this is like the Philadelphia little flyers in the EHL from years ago. Yes. They won 40 games the, that year. Three right? losses. Uh, so yeah. the record for wins in a single season in the EHLP is 37. And there were 44 games played that year. This year we play 42. So, if you break the record in fewer games played, you it's technically pretty, pretty, pretty unique, right? Um, <laughs> you win. Do they break the record? Three games left have Jake. to win, have to win <laughs> two of them. Yeah, they win. Yeah. Okay. Duh. Okay. Uh, are all their games left, Jake? Just showcase games? Yeah, they have to be. Last uh, normal game uh, yesterday against Seahawks. Normal game. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, two twenty fives are not normal. True. True. Um, they faced Adirondack, the Wolves, and the Huntsman. Yeah, that's a gauntlet. That's a yeah. gauntlet. And that's they got like an 8 oof. p.m., 8 a.m., I think. So, geez. They, they Ooh, been, quick turnaround. Oh, yeah, or like a 6 Ooh. p.m., game, something like that. The so P guys awesome. are fine, though. They're so young, they can do it. They're, very, <laughs> they're up late. How about times. that scheduler, Jeff? They faced Adirondack on <laughs> Saturday guy. night at 8.15 p.m. They faced the Wolves the next what? morning, 12 uh, hours hmm. later, 8.15 a.m. Uh, and then they oh, face oh. the Huntsman on Monday morning at 8.30 a.m. So, uh, like the four seed, at, or like the the, the uh, yes. at-large team at Providence. Yeah, it's, it's true. It's, <laughs> it's, it's preparation, that's all. Um, but obviously, they've clinched the regular season title in the EHLP, so they're the number one seed. Everything is locked in for them in the Boston division. Speaking of that at-large, they still do have to win at least the first-round series for that at-large bid at a minimum, to kick in. But looking down the rest of the division from there, um, I was talking to the Seahawks coaching staff during the regional showcase. Obviously, it was EHL only. But it's almost it almost surprised me that the Seahawks EHLP team, guys, has 40 points. Yeah, they're they're pesky, man. Sneaky they're pesky. Good. They hit everything that moves. Uh, they have good goaltending. They're a pesky team. They would be in oh, second 18, place. 15, 3, and 1. They'd be in second place in the New England division. And they'd be in third place in the Middle Atlantic division. Way to go, but, Coach Richard. But they're nice in fifth job. place <laughs> of their current division. So, uh, yes, awesome. speaking of Coach Richard, he did ask if there was a way to vote uh, to change the at large to just a second Boston team. I was like, well, I mean, well, could, they've it, beaten, it, they beat every team ahead of them in the standings. It, it in that could Boston play out that way. It, it could. He's like, you know, we could have our own little losers bracket. We all play things out, and the and then that team also earns their way in. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it kind of makes sense, but it'd be a crazy uh, element Formula. to kind of add in on the fly here. So, <laughs> let's say in the years to come, you'd have to have all these teams continue their success to yes. uh, make that worth it. So. For sure, for sure. I like that idea though. 
coach. He was he was just pointing out how uh, how well they've done the in, in a very tough division, right? Uh, yeah. The Rangers currently are the two seed if the playoffs started today uh, with 55 points. They do have a game in hand also on Valley in a three-point lead, so that helps um, express or I wouldn't say locked in a, a, as the four right now, but uh, they can catch Valley. They're three points behind with a game in hand. So uh, big games for them down the stretch as well. Obviously, the Seahawks uh, and, and Bridgewater are, are, are basically in the spots that they are, right? Um, to the New England division, uh, Adirondack, that you see the XY there. They're obviously uh, officially in as the one seed in their division for the second straight year. Um, last year, they were knocked off, though, in the first round. So I'm sure they want some uh, revenge for that. And as we mentioned a few times in this podcast, it feels like it's almost set up and scripted this way, but the Wolves get the Avalanche, the two New Hampshire teams, uh, and then Vermont gets Adirondack, the two teams close to each other up north, right? Almost like you split the division in half. But things can Beautiful. change. Wolves and Avalanche change. still fighting for home ice advantage, too. Yes, yes, and we did. They're just did. separated by one point. The Wolves did tweet that the, they swept the season series against the Avalanche yesterday. I did not... I did not notice that they had won every single game of that season series. So um, sometimes oh. that's good. Sometimes that's not good, though, once you play you play each other in the postseason, right? Um, and then, Anthony, you kind of mentioned this before. A huge day tomorrow at Power Play Ranks. Both Huntsman uh, 87s teams face off against each other. Um, it's actually a benefit game. I'm not sure if you guys knew this, but the the Huntsmen are doing a uh, – it's a fundraiser for mental health uh tomorrow i'm not sure if it's both teams wearing specialty jerseys um or just one uh but there there's a foundation that they're raising money for tomorrow night um all led by uh aiden parkerson and the whole thing up for the huntsman so pretty cool that's awesome what were you gonna say anthony oh no i was just gonna say uh like what you said uh it's a big matchup i know the huntsman's been hyping it up on social media quite a bit yes. That's with the back to back, I mean, it's just it's just been a rivalry from the get go, and they're, they're certainly fun games to watch. I know the what to watch for segments coming up in a little bit, but uh, I, I mean, definitely want to keep an eye on tomorrow. No, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Um, for those that are wondering, because uh, we this is a you know a factual podcast, we have to point out facts and make sure everyone knows what's taking place. Um, the 87 Chiefs game that took that was supposed to take place earlier this season but got canceled because of ice issues will not be made up, right? So back to my anxiety, there are two teams that will not reach 42 <laughs> games. There are two teams oh, in the no. Mid-Atlantic that will reach just 41. Um, those are the 87s and the Chiefs. Everybody else will get to 42. If the two points that either team could have won would have made a difference – in the playoff seating for either of those teams, the math will be done to figure out the better, the higher points percentage, right? So if the Huntsman at 87s are close enough where the two points from that game would have mattered, we'll figure out which team had the higher points percentage. So that's the percentage of points earned out of how many you could have earned to figure out who the one, two are. And for the Chiefs, uh, it would really come down between them and Union for who the five, six are, right? If we get to a situation where even if you add the two points to either team, it wouldn't have made a difference in their seed, we just go by points. So um, it's a big game regardless, though, tomorrow between the Huntsman and the 87s for that exact reason, because the Huntsman have, have a five-point gap in the standings right now, and they're trying to clinch that one seed because uh, it looks like we're on a crash course for a Huntsman 87s final series and hosting game Ooh. three hosting game three would be invaluable so that's where everything well, the stands get to providence to defend their title exactly but look at we'll quietly see. won eight straight games right so uh peaking at the right time uh but that that does it for around the east show it's time to start talking about some of the players that are absolutely exploding right now in fantasy because there are guys that are having huge months uh, in the month of February. So let's jump to the E-Show Fantasy Challenge. Now it's time for the E-Show Fantasy Challenge. Follow along on the EHL app. Available now for free on both Apple iOS and Android. And as we start off every week, we do a quick little update on our Yahoo League that Jeff and I are in. Uh, Jeff absolutely <laughs> waxed me 
last Woo! week. I mean, you put up 170 board. something points. And I like, did that all with the, the services of Morgan Riley all week. I, uh, yeah, that was, uh, like I said to you in our text, though, Neil, too little too late for Meek Mills. I am four, four and 14 now yeah. in 11th place. Right. Only Jim McCabe, CK, and Chiefs at two and 16 are below me. So, um, yeah, playoffs are not on my side. So, I'll, I'll, my condolences, my friends, because I really hope I didn't screw up your your playoff hopes. But yeah, I don't know. I'm the, winning, I'm winning this week in. against the fourth place team. Okay. Um, I'm in ninth place. Eight teams make it. I will. I don't know. We'll see. Again, well, like always. Is, though, uh, Jeff, I'm, what are you I'm trying to help you though, because I'm uh, I'm actually beating Dairy Queen, who is two spots ahead of you. So I'm actually projected to beat them. They have oh, the well, same that would be huge. Eight, I would nine. forgive you if you win that one. I, I would forgive you then at that point. All right. Cool. cool, cool, cool. <laughs> and, and if That's not, Jeff, we'll just both jump over to DraftKings instead. Because screw Yahoo. That sounds good. Yep, screw Yahoo, because we know hockey games move fast, but with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL, you can score faster than anything happening on the ice. This week, new customers can bet 5 bucks and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. And you can do that by downloading the DraftKings Sportsbook app with code THPN. New customers can bet just 5 bucks in the NHL and get 200 instantly in bonus bets only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code THPN. The crown is yours. Uh, and do you have a gambling problem? If so, you can call 1-800-GAMBLER or you can visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, you can call 877-8-H-O-P-E-N-Y or you can text H-O-P-E-N-Y, which is 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. You can void that in Ontario. Bonus bets do expire 168 hours after issuance. So see dkng.com slash hockey for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. NHL and the NHL Shield are registered trademarks of the National Hockey League. Copyright NHL 2024. All rights reserved. Uh, so Kevin Unger has already set a new record for points in a single month. Uh, he's wow. at 133.4 points. Um, and oh we still have God. plenty of games left. I, I, you could say, right. Um, Davis Kinney and Ryan Croshaw have 51.4 points each. Yeah. For him. Davis Kinney oh. has essentially locked up the defenseman of the month award. He's got four goals, 11 assists, 12 power play points, oh. one shorthanded point, a hat trick and a game winner for 51 points. Like, He's, he's nasty. He's basically the defenseman of the month. He's nasty. So we joined Jake for an interview again the other day. Yes, we we uh we got a few laughs from that one. And Davis will say was very uh focused for ga- the game. Uh if you if you mm-hmm. if you watch the interview, he was getting really ready for that game. Um but to the uh forwards, I do want to point out uh Harrison Kramer has 45 points so far this month. Uh he has nine goals, including a hat trick. He's been obviously the guy for the Wolves all season long. So I'm sure they'll mm-hmm. continue to lean on him as they head towards what feels like an inevitable first round series against the Avalanche. Um, one of his line mates right below him, Jack's Kovacs, uh, Jack Kovacs, I should say 32 points. Uh, we mentioned Apple players. Luke Olisano has 37 so far this month. I've heard a lot from the Railers staff about uh, what Marcus Christofides has done. He's got 29 fantasy points this month. Wait, did uh, we say uh, Galasano has how many fantasy points? 37. 37. Oh, it's coming up as 24 for me. I'm getting robbed out of points here, Neil. You switched <laughs> You switched late. Are you? That's how it works? Yes. Yeah. Oh, rules. Yes. That's terrible. That's terrible. I, yeah, all right, Zach Rolo leaves. It's Jake's fault, everybody. He gets robbed of his points. Okay, Jake, you know how the rules – this is how the rules work. If you have to sub print, my son. somebody in, you can't just pick yeah. whoever has the best month. That'd be like me saying, you know what, I'm going to change my D well, to David I Kitty. switched because my player left. Yeah, so you – Not like I was like, I want to get the best guy. I'll so, take – you skinny. made that switch, though. You made that switch on February 9th. So since February 9th, 
He has 24 <laughs> points for you. That's Jake, great. Jake, Jake, Jake is going to try to rewrite the fantasy challenge <laughs> collective bargaining agreement. Yes, he, he in definitely the may. Season. He definitely may. That's robbery. That's robbery, man. Just to highlight the, a few the, more. East, the East Show Players Association. Yes. This is Stop. unethical. This is how we treat the E crew here. <laughs> oh my God. Just to highlight a few more forwards that are popping up this month. <laughs> Uh, Peter Unger with 31 fantasy points. Same thing with P.J. Sweeney. Peyton Myers with 45 fantasy points for the Express yeah, EHLP team. Uh, Jumping and, off that score. And then, and then there's a bunch of goalies that are really having great months. Adam Casper, uh, four wins, three of which have been via a shutout. I mean, he's got 40 points. Evan Plunkett's got 44. Just announced his commitment this morning to St. Michael's. Uh, Cam Reardon, as he does every month, gets over 200 saves. <laughs> so he's got 32 <laughs> points. Uh, you mentioned uh, Jake Hugeson, 45.2 points uh, so far this month. Three wins, including a shutout. Uh, Jordan Dumont, uh, Chief CHLP, 29 points. I mean, and then the list just keeps going on and on and on right here. Uh, Ronnie Petrucci, 35. Ryan Kraushaw, 51. Um, I mean, how, how good is Croshaw though? He just lost the game. Yeah, it's, it's right? a great point. Anthony. Like, it's a great point. Uh, total scrub. <laughs> so, uh, but as we mentioned, Kevin Unger, it's almost like he has the X. He almost he almost has clinched February. Not officially. Yeah, right. But he's got 133.4, so he's got you know a 31 point lead. He would be the fifth and final ticket punch the round of champions, but. Crazy things can happen here. Um, the highest E crew member is actually Jake's brother. Mikey is at Mikey ninth place. So it would be a top 10 finish. Uh, I mean, I'd be right place. outside the top 10 if I wasn't getting robbed right now, but that's okay. no big deal. <laughs> oh, Neil, actually, look at that. We got four consecutive E crews Mikey and nine, Justin and 10, Chris in 11th, and I'm in 12th. Yes. Put me as an asterisk in 11th. <laughs> <right? laughs> We have lost Jake for this episode. Well, I, actually, I mean, well, I, I guess if we're talking about like rule changes for next season, I, I feel like it, it w- wouldn't be a bad yeah. idea to have no, really, to have people pick different players each month. Because you, you look at number two through five, and it's all the same players. Where it's uh, David Bazin, Jack Costable, Ryan Croshaw. Where I feel like it, it would be more of a better challenge for some of the fans and parents to try to pick different players. I think just a matter this, of giving players more. This was long. something we did before. Anthony, remember, actually, this is something we did before with all, when we did our uh, like E crew fantasy that you couldn't pick the same guys more than what was it, Neil twice, three times. Yeah. But there were only like five of us picking. So it was a little easier to yeah. track that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Anthony, if you want to sign up for that project, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, It'll get voted through a flying colors. If we did. Yes. But with that, we do have a handful of games that are taking place between now and our next podcast, which will set the table for the showcase. So let's update the schedule uh, and what to watch for. And now here's what to watch for in the EHL and the EHLP. What to watch for is presented by Flow Hockey, the official streaming platform for your EHL and EHLP action throughout the 2023-2024 season. As we mentioned, recording this on Friday, February 23rd, two very big games today at noon, 87s at Maryland and Valley at Seacoast. Two games with huge playoff implications uh, for for all the teams involved. Uh, Tomorrow, we mentioned that Express Avalanche game and the 87th Huntsman game. We also have Rangers Providence tomorrow night, guys. Rangers obviously fighting to try and not be the three seed. Uh, Providence fighting to be the three seed. Uh, in, in their division, uh, Bears with a win would lock up the number one seed tomorrow night against the Philadelphia Hockey Club. This is a weird one. I didn't expect to see this on a on a Sunday in February. Uh, Chiefs versus Wizards. That's a hmm. cross division matchup on a random Sunday in February. So, uh, and then Rangers Bandits on Sunday night. Uh, Bandits Terriers on on, on Monday. So back to back for the Bandits who are trying to catch the Seahawks. Uh, for that final playoff spot in the East of it, uh, East division, you got Seahawks playing the Rangers on Tuesday, uh, rough riders chiefs for the 30th time or whatever Anthony said on, on Tuesday as well. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and then Wednesday's game is express terriers, little flyers, bears and railers, Rhode Island. 
And next Thursday, there I see two games right before the showcase, Seacoast Warriors and 87's Rough Riders. So a good handful of games leading up to that showcase, and maybe a few more seeds will become official between now and the start of the showcase. But I guess I guess we'll see, right? Uh, as for we'll play the, the games, we'll see. Yes, exactly. As for the EHLP, we have Little Fires Huntsman tonight. Um, five games tomorrow, including that 87th Huntsman game that we already did mention there. Um, four more games on Sunday. Adirondacks had a two game series with the Renegades, Little Fires Union play, Seahawks Express play. That could be, could be a playoff uh, preview. And then only one game leading up to the start of the showcase, Rangers Warriors. There's a two three huge matchup next Wednesday, the 28th. Uh, the two teams fighting those for those spots right now in the Boston division. So one more episode before the showcase, guys. Six days to to gear up. Jeff, you'll we'll FaceTime you throughout. Yes, sounds good. I can't wait. I but uh we'll we will probably be a excited. little a little more tired than you are next week. Yeah, I think so, buddy. <laughs> I think so do so. I have do I have Zach Grolo's assist and goal on February first as well? Or am I just no, getting you, you don't that? like you wipe Jake's out what you have. That's you start... so crazy. <laughs> And that's yeah, the, that's, that's the you know what my what to watch for is justice in the Eastern Hockey League. That's not <laughs> justice will be served, uh, I'm, or I'm, will it? I'm I'm not sure how how else to structure these rules. I mean, this is I, I, I deserve grow those points. He's dying on this hill, Neil. Okay, two points, and you still aren't beating Kevin Unger. It's the principle <laughs> of the matter. <laughs> He's fighting for respect points now. It's like you're getting killed like six nothing. You're like, let me just get a goal so it doesn't get shut out. You know when the pro teams like appeal the result of the game? We're gonna have this like appeal hearing. He, he's he's uh, gonna in, take in, it up in, to in, Joe Joe Britannia. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's gonna... I don't know. I hit Joe with a puck by accident at the show game. I don't think Joe's gonna be in my corner for this yeah, one. Yeah, Jake was working on his face offs in the uh, office that we were in, Anthony, and he fired one at Joe. I, I, <laughs> I, was, I want it clean though, dude. <laughs> yeah, he did. He, he definitely want it clean. <laughs> off the shin <laughs> so um uh, but yeah it feels like we got 15 games or so combined between the two divisions leading up to uh next week's showcase and uh maybe just maybe a few a few more x's will become official uh, on the standings pages but if not obviously this is all gearing up for that final showcase uh with 64 games over over a four-day span <laughs> so but thanks again to wiggle for coming on the podcast with jeff and i Thanks, Jake and Anthony. Uh, enjoy the six days of rest and preparation uh, before the gala weekend that we have uh, in Philly. We'll talk to you guys next week. See you, boys. Thanks for listening to The E! Show, presented by the Hockey Podcast Network. Learn more about us at easternhockeyleague.org and follow us on all of your favorite social media platforms. Also, be sure to subscribe and get notified when our next podcast episode is released.